Hi, I'm Dr. Alexandra Katahakis, Clinical Director of the Center for Healthy Sex in Los Angeles. And last spring, I was at the Esalen Institute where I was teaching a weekend workshop on women's sexuality and ran into an old friend of mine, Rob Santos, who's a marriage family therapist and who I trained with many years ago at the Southern California Counseling Center. And I know that Rob is um, a postmodern therapist. He's very interested in the social construction of our identities, both as men, women, and our sexuality. So I invited him to sit down with me and talk about the Me Too movement, what's happening with this cultural shift and how women and men um, are interacting with each other today. We talked about sex education, how to be a sexually conscious uh, parent or raise sexually conscious children. So we covered a lot of ground and I hope that that this conversation will inspire you to think about other ideas um, about how the shifting tide of female and male, uh, both gender roles and interactions are taking place today and what you might do to carry forward these conversations for change. I guess my question is um, just how you perceive, this is a big question, yeah. what men are up against today, especially in relation to um, sex and sexuality and for heterosexual men, well really gay men too because this has come up, Sure. Um, what the rules are in, of engagement are when it comes to yeah. being sexual and dating and just being in the workplace also. Yeah, I, I don't want to be the sort of arbiter of everyone's experience but I, I do wind up having a lot of thoughts about this just as a, you know, identifying as a straight white upper middle class guy of a certain amount of privilege and sort mm -hmm. of being raised, I'm 50 now, and so being raised in a, you know, in the sort of early days of this sexual culture, right? Like I was sort of born, you know, amidst the feminist movement right. and, uh, you know, I and all the sort of guys that have come after me, you know, I've sort of had this, this framing thought that, you know, we all sort of exist at this funny double bind sort of crossroads of guidelines for just how to be a man like masculinity has been this up in the air uh like how to be a man has been you know a matter of following one of either the traditional guideline mm -hmm. or some new kind of ad hoc unwritten guideline that exists after the feminist movement. Yeah, so that's a pretty strong bifurcation. There's something really rigid about that and not very flexible. Yeah, and, and you know, oftentimes, I mean, women have this experience all the time. Of course, yeah. Of, of feeling like the rules that they're having to live mm. under or the, the, the different masters that they need to serve in a given moment don't leave them any actual place to stand. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really the case for guys too, you know, where, you know, according to traditional ideas, you're uh, supposed to make all the decisions, not care in any way what your uh, female partner has to say, just expect her to sort of do all of the housework and take care of all of your emotional needs. Mm -hmm. And according to this other guideline, you're expected to be somebody that has uh, in a facility with talking about his emotions, with sort of making space for the other person's experience, for being a co-equal and a co-pilot of the mm -hmm. relationship that you're going to be sort of 50% responsible for the emotional well-being of the relationship none of which there have been any really good models for right. in any broad way uh, and so there's all these moments and, and guys today I always feel like just about any guy that you speak to will if you put to him the question of like do you want your female partner to um you know, keep her experience to herself? Do you want her not to have any influence over the decisions of your relationship? Do you want her to, uh, you know, basically just be a traditional mm -hmm. subordinate? Right. Most guys today will say no. They, right. want, they want a friend and a co-pilot and right. someone to help navigate relationship with. You know, as you're talking, I was starting to think, wow, have we actually um, colonized men into thinking they have to have their emotions and feelings the way that women do mm -hmm. because that's the just saying that I want a uh, women want a man who um, is going to be emotionally intelligent and mm -hmm. you know be able to have these emotional conversations and be heard and seen and all of that but according to whose compass mm -hmm. 
Um, so I think that was one of the follies of the 70s is women wanted sensitive men who could have their feelings. And when men started to show up that way, they were like, oh, I don't want you to have that many feelings. I don't want you to look that soft or non-assertive. So it really it begs the question of who's setting the roadmap for this? How do men figure out what that means? The way I sort of understand women's requests, uh, request of men now is not that they be soft and not that they be sort of feminized, but mm -hmm. that they be uh, self-responsible for their experience. So they, they be sort of uh, effective in being able to name their experience and manage their own experience and manage their actual emotional state. Because, right. you know, what women are, you know, will continue to complain about is that they themselves become like the relationship managers and the emotional mm -hmm. managers for both people. You know, right. this whole sort of trope where women are complaining like, that that their husbands are like another one of their children. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, to me, it's just a, an expression of women having the experience that when it comes to emotions, he, he doesn't have it. He can't take care of himself. Right? And so, and I wind up becoming his emotional manager. I wound up becoming, you know, the only place where he experiences mm -hmm. a wider range of emotions. Uh, you know, and, and the recipe for her becoming parentified in that, Right, but it's it's challenging because culturally, how do we raise emotionally intelligent boys? And what is the cultural wraparound about that? Because oftentimes, like I heard a radio ad the other day, and I noticed that a lot of radio ads make men sound like adults or, you know, sort of blumbering idiots. Like the woman's yeah. always like, hey, there's a sale going on that he doesn't know about. Like I'm going to go do something behind his back. And it's patronizing, I guess, in a way. That, that's the way that, um, so that's one way that I hear culturally that men get denigrated. And then, of course, there's the overblown masculine um, archetype in our culture also. Sure. So how do we, um, as a culture, start to shift and change this male identity? Because we're asking men to do something that may not be, you know, an evolutionary directive in the organism, but that gets socially constructed if we put our attention on it. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I mean, I'm always going to sort of side with the idea that, like, you know, cultural forces are going to be more influential than whatever we're sort of designed to do evolutionarily. It mm -hmm. feels like a, you know, feels like a weak force for the most part uh, in, in terms of, like, how, we, you know, the shapes we bend ourselves into in terms of human culture. Sure. It's, 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 it's really, you know, the first place to look. Um, well, I always say that you can take an infant, a child, and make them into, you know, a saint or a sociopath, right. depending on the environmental influences right. on that organism, that creature. Right. Saint is kind of a big word, so sociopath, but those are the extremes that, depending on how you treat and nurture and, you know, teach a child about who they are as a human yeah. being will depend on what you create. A, a world in which, you know you know, little boys sort of have examples of men being uh, effective in their emotions, uh, sort of being able to sort of like speak their experience, speak wants and needs, mm -hmm. make space for and recognize wants and mm -hmm. needs in other people. That's a big thing, make space for and listen to. Oh yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Those sort of twin stereotypes you're talking about, the sort of like hyper-masculine right. uh, and the, the, the sort of childlike, dull, disempowered, the disempowered right? sort of... Uh, you know, lunkhead who... Mm -hmm. uh, well, there's a disowned masculinity. Like, there's a lack of male assertion and aggression in that stereotype. Mm -hmm. And then the other one has a lack of emotional intelligence and kindness and sensitivity in the other. Sure. Yeah, so one is all aggression and one is all sensitivity. Right. And these are the sort of, like, I'm either a bad boy or, or, the a, or a friend zone. Yeah, right. Right. Um, they, they just feel like two sides to the same problematic sure. stereotype, right, right? Uh, of guys that are either, you know, mm -hmm. over uh, overbearing and transgressing of boundaries, mm -hmm. disregarding of boundaries, right, which is, just, right. which is a way of being centered in your own experience, uh, or they're completely factless and incapable of uh, knowing their own experience and having preferences, having desires, and saying so. Right. And, you know, I just don't... What I like about the Me Too movement is it's characterized by women getting super clear about uh, what is and isn't okay, right. right? Suddenly there's this sense of license of like, oh, no, no, actually, if I want to be clear, that's not cool. It's never been cool, mm -hmm. right? And that's not mine. That's yours, right? Right. And so it feels like this is a moment where um, 
women are uh, basically putting something back in men's laps and saying, this is yours, figure out mm -hmm. how to own this. Right. And the thing is, you and your experience, right? Yeah. You and your desires, you and your hopes, you and your sort of initiatives. Or boundarylessness. All your feelings, all your, yeah. like, you know, transgressing my boundaries and making me responsible for your feelings mm -hmm. is no longer a strategy for managing your experience. <laughs> right, that's great. You know what I mean? And yeah. it, to me, that's what it feels like. So both of those stereotypes um, s start to dissolve mm -hmm. uh, when that... Uh, interaction really starts to take hold yeah when men sort of are getting the picture now I, I don't know how that I don't know how that transpires in any organized way because it'll just I, I feel like it's gonna take a generation of men to be like oh right we are responsible for our right. own feelings I have this trope that I use with guys all the time that some some of them feel resonates um, and it's this idea that, uh, you know, we were all sort of raised, most of us were raised in an emotional culture that uh, basically allows, after a certain age, for three publicly expressible emotions, right? Mm. Like after a certain age, eight, nine, whatever, right. you, you can no longer go onto the playground and express any human emotion mm. except for three, which is awesome, right? fine, and pissed. Right. I was going to say right. angry, but... Yeah. yeah, exactly, right. Right. Like, I'm pissed off, I'm awesome, right. or whatever. Just beige. Yeah, just beige, Bland, exactly, right. Fine, right. Like, those are, you know... Mm -hmm. And you know, and, and and a lot of guys really relate to that. Just sure. Since, you know, you know, if you were nine years old, you wouldn't go into the playground, and you know, someone says, "How are you doing?" It's like, oh, I'm a little bit scared of that woman or that girl. Right. And, yeah. You know, I let them sort of, you know, feel like I failed the test, and I'm, you know, yeah, full feel of shame. Feel bad about myself. Feel right? bad about yeah. myself. You know, I don't know, sort of, my body feels weird. You right. know, there's just the constraint. It feels like it's really analogous to whatever that constraint is that ha that crops up for girls around age ten or twelve. Oh right. Where they where really smart, high performing girls mm -hmm. start saying that they don't know things. They start uh, invisibilizing their own right. knowledge. Right. Right. Sort of yeah, becoming more submissive and not too much. Yeah. Yeah. Like it feels like intimate partnerships, more broadly, are the sole location where men can experiment with like having a wider range mm. of emotions mm. where they can sort of like you know have these training wheels she's the only person that knows me in this way mm, right yeah um and then uh, i mean sex is such a complication of that dynamic to the extent that oh man it, 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 you know a it's completely overrun with normative ideas all right about what you're supposed to be what your body's supposed to mm -hmm. look like how it's supposed to function how you're supposed what to do it yeah exactly it is completely impoverished in terms of knowledge about eroticism mm -hmm. and knowledge is basic psychological knowledge certainly basic knowledge about how her body right is and and works and, and how works. unique her body is to other hers yeah exactly every woman's body is different yeah um in so many different ways it's like two it's like two layers of ignorance like men yeah, you're men, right. men men basically don't have any understanding of like what the clitoris is or like how exactly. female anatomy is broadly and then that second layer of who you're actually sleeping with and right. what their pleasure is today. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I mean, and that I think speaks to just this gross, continued lack of sex education in our culture for starters. So we educate our children and our young people about nothing about sex. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the, there's this other intimacy piece about who I am as a person, who you are, and really getting to know each other and explore each other in that way. Yeah. And because of that part you were talking about where men are just supposed to know what to do to women to bring them pleasure yeah based they, on what <laughs> so so you know you're gonna get zero information zero education mm -hmm. no no information to frame your experience right no information to how to talk to your partner about experience and if uh somebody doesn't feel good or doesn't have a positive experience or if your body doesn't function the way it's supposed to right. you're a failure 
So it's just like, it's a failure trap in every it direction. Is. Yeah, I don't know if you see this, but we certainly see it here. Like younger and younger men, I'm talking men in their 20s coming in with, you know, anxiety mm. issues around sexual performance. Yeah. Um, you know, inability to get an erection or they're ejaculating too rapidly. But yeah. all these sexual dysfunctions that used to be in the domain of like, you know, 60-year-old men. It feels like there's twin forces there. One is guys coming in earlier saying i'm not meeting the norm right right uh because they're immersed in lots more sexual imagery lots sure. more shitty unintentional sex education right. in the porn world but the other is they're engaging with issues of sexuality earlier in life yeah that's true too you know what i mean so and so a certain percentage of them are are experiencing that as like oh I, i've got a problem mm-hmm in, in, in a weird way, it feels like a positive sign. Well, because I don't look like that or I can't perform like that, but there are lots of stats now that show that people are having sex much later than they did. Yeah. You know, people used to go steady and have sex in their teens, which yeah. is when all the hormones are coming online and people are meant to be experimenting sexually. Yeah. And now they're waiting until their mid-20s, sometimes late-20s. I mean, we have females coming in here that are virgins in their late-20s. Yeah. Um, and they're completely, you know, just so angry anxious and afraid yeah. of sex and sexuality so it, it uh, in some cases it is what you just said and in other cases it's having a reverse effect that everybody's yeah. just so stunned and freaked out yeah 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 um, that makes about sense. their bodies and how to be that they don't know how to be and there is this weird cultural bind especially um, now for women where all the messages all the billboards all the buses everything we see really is saying you should be porn ready at all times yeah, you yeah, know yeah. shaved g-string yeah, yeah, boobed yeah. ready to go yeah, yeah. but then there's this deep puritanical thread that says but don't do it because you're bad or dirty if you yeah. do that that's horrible and it's like yeah. you talk about like a schizophrenic bind really. oh my god it's impossible there's nowhere to stand and then with men they you know are intimidated because they think they should you know the women are coming on strong oftentimes in this sort of performance way that's not really me mm -hmm. and then the guys are like whoa why are you doing that that's too much mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah sure so they can be intimidated yeah so what do we do and i guess there's no doing it's just the constant talking about it i mean i agree i feel like the talking about it is the doing mm. and, uh, and again it's what i it's what i like about me too yeah i think me too is uh, at its core a an act of speech right mm. it's an act of saying right I, i'm clear let me tell you about what's true right. for me. And practice is going to evolve over time as a result of that. I mean, and, and you know, it's a super disruptive time. It is, you yeah. know, like porn landed like a fucking meteor <clears throat> in did, sexual right. culture. Right. Uh, I don't know if my obscenity is going to make this unusable tape, but, no. you know, porn landed like a meteor <laughs> right. in, in our culture. Uh, and, uh, the the sort of recalibration i'm actually weirdly optimistic yeah you know things don't turn horrible politically but like right. you know I'm, I'm, I'm weirdly optimistic that that we're in the sort of chaotic stage of like a reformation around mm -hmm. sexuality. Sex sexuality i yeah. agree i think that's been one of the unbelievable positive things about internet pornography is mm. that people started to see these wide and varied ways of being sexual yeah. that weren't that were sort of interesting and exciting and curious and maybe even also repugnant and something they would never want to do but with the advent of 50 shades of gray mm. um so many young women that i talk to are having you know light bdsm experiences yeah. they're trying so many different things that they find arousing and exciting mm -hmm. that people would never have tried before it was yeah. always you know, there was this kind of vanilla sex world or they were considered, everything else was a fetish. Right. And even the word fetish is starting to deconstruct. And it's sure. like, well, what is fetishistic really? It's, it's like the really? thing I'm yeah. into. Yeah, <laughs> right. sure, yeah. So that, I think, is all the good news. The bad yeah. news, as with anything, is the dark side or the shadow, the underbelly of it, yeah. where there is there can be gross exploitation and violence yeah. and pain and degradation as yeah. a result. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, how do people, men and women, start to ask them questions about you know who am I sexually yeah what do I really like what is yeah. true for me in relation to 
another person, same sex, opposite sex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because even me too is like saying, you know, no, this is where it ends, or this is what's true for me mm -hmm. at the moment, is what you said. Right. Yeah. Or I'm starting to find out that I even have the right to speak up about this. Yeah. Yeah. That's I, kind of a new thing. Yeah. 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 Like I, I sort of reclaim my right to know my own preferences to not know my own preferences. Right. 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 And to say to be I don't in know. process about it. Yeah. The force of shame in isolation mm -hmm. feels like the distinguishing characteristic between the pursuit of a healthy sexual practice. Right. Whatever right. your whatever your interest is. Yeah. And destructive uh, sexual and destructive practices. sexual practices. Yeah. 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 And I think that goes back to you know, how people learn about their sex and sexuality, their bodies, the culture, what it says about it. Yeah. Um, and the, just the lack of sex education. I mean, the studies yeah. I've read about the Scandinavian countries and how they start educating their children in kindergarten about yeah. what it means to touch and yeah. like somebody and, you know, their bodies and good touch, bad touch. And every um, sort of, not year, but like in then into elementary school, there's a different conversation. And then yeah. when girls start menstruating, a different one. And yeah. um, there's studies that show that those teenagers wait longer to have sex and, and they're glad that they do um, uh, and sex is just kind of a normal bodily function developmental thing that goes on just like oh, getting wow. pubic hair and getting taller oh, wow. um, whereas kids in the states that were interviewed and I don't remember the number of the controls etc but uh, that they wish they had waited longer yeah. Um, than they did. And yeah. so they just have a different experience about their sexual, emerging sexual bodies than we give our kids here. And, yeah. Um, when it is shame based, as you well know, it goes deeply underground. And then people start doing things, they start using it as a, a way of hurting themselves. Yeah. Like sure. this is bad, and I'm a bad and dirty person. Yeah. And this is proof positive that I'm a bad and dirty person. Right, right. And it becomes right. like this crazy tumbleweed where all yeah. of a sudden you don't even know where the thing began. Right. It's just so bad in adulthood. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, what a difference that would make. It's, it's interesting. I think I, I, I'm glad to hear about that research. I've mm -hmm. you know, seen sort of anecdotal evidence of, you know, in Denmark, they have these anatomically correct coloring books for yeah. kindergartners and third-year right, sure. And I think that that's... And they name their body parts real body parts, not like names after sort of cartoon characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My willy. Right. This is like a yeah. vagina. This is a penis. Yeah, right? yeah, it's not yeah. a willy. Yeah, exactly. Or, you know, some other, you know, personified. My hoo-ha. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> Thank you. I couldn't think of what it was. <laughs> that kind of education that that normalizes the body and, and I think also speaks to the idea of sexual pleasure, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. which feels super crucial. Right. Um, I mean, who's talking to kids about the idea of sexual pleasure? They don't. They get, you know, sex education, like here's how to put a condom on a banana and don't get an STI and don't get pregnant. So it's all the don'ts of disease. Yeah. It's not the do's of pleasure. Like you're going to start experiencing these hormones at 14 years old and it's going to make you want to make out and touch and your body's going to get excited by it. And, yeah. you know, for females, that the sole purpose of the clitoris is for pleasure. Yeah. It has no other function. It's not an organ that you can urinate out of or, you know, tell the time by. It only yeah. does one thing. Yeah. And that girls aren't educated about that. They kind of discover in secret or Oof. like uh, I've heard so many st stories you know in the shower with a you know a pulsing shower jet or in the jacuzzi mm -hmm. or um, some other foreign like oops way I, you know just at some point along the line to just sit the kids down and be like there's this thing called the clitoris. There's this right. the, here. Here are the surfaces of your penis that you're going to find very interesting. Right. You know. Well, and also especially because children during the you know what was sort of oldly called the latent stage, like four years old, yeah, little right. girls are constantly touching their vaginas yeah, at that age. Yeah. And so sitting that, on the washing machine. But it's interesting because yeah. parents at that age will say, "Oh, you know that I know that makes you feel good, and you should do that at home and not mm -hmm. in the supermarket." And mm -hmm. they give them some talk about it. But once they start to hit puberty, nobody mentions it again wow. like remember yeah. that thing you did at four where you wow. couldn't get your hands off your vagina yeah guess what it's coming yeah. again in a different way now. yeah exactly exactly yeah 
when the whole culture constructs it as like this ooh, weird sort of taboo sure. subject. But it's also the way in which the parent talks about it, so that it's not invasive. You're not in your child's sex life yeah. or your teenager's sex life more uh, accurately. Yeah. But you let them know that you're available if they have questions. Mm -hmm. They can ask any question. It's not mm -hmm. shameful. It's not dirty or wrong. Yeah. Um, if you don't want to talk to me, there's a book for that. Right, the, right, right, right. Yeah, click here. So um, right. just all of the stuff that goes around helping, I think, steward kids into being the kind of adults we're talking about being. Yeah. I'm not a sex educator, and, and I'd be interested to know from those that are, like, what the hope is for some, like, programmatic, mm -hmm. you know, alteration in policy that would get us closer to this. Right. Uh, this outcome, but, uh, I mean, if anything, it feels like at a systemic level, the culture is going in the wrong direction. But I think one of the things I hear you saying is that this is a highly disruptive time. There yeah. is a sea change yeah. that it's going to take a couple generations to move through uh, by way of these kind of ongoing public conversations. I hope you enjoyed our conversation as much as Rob and I enjoyed having it. And you may be asking yourself the same way we were asking ourselves, what do I do? Where do I go from here? And I would encourage you to continue this conversation amongst your own friends, your own family members, so that you don't have to feel helpless or hopeless about these highly complicated questions um, and situations that we find ourselves in in our culture today.